In this episode of the Photography News Podcast, Will tells you how to win competitions, Roger reveals his best piece of photo advice, and Kingsley shoots a portrait in an unusual location. Hello and welcome to episode four of the Photography News Podcast. My name is Roger Payne, I'm the Editorial Director at Photography News, and one more time I'm joined by two members of the Photography News team, when I can say it properly. Uh, the first is contributing editor, Mr. Kingsley Singleton. Hi, Kingsley. Hi. <laughs> hello. This is the bit when, where you say hello. <laughs> when you say, well, I was thrown because you said, I'm joined one more time. So I'm, I was just, I was expecting to get my cards. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get through it and then we'll tell you how you've done. <laughs> Hi, Kingsley. Nice to have you along. And the other person, the man who uh, we always say needs no introduction, but we're going to introduce him anyway, Mr. Photography, Will Chung. Hi, Will. Hi, guys. How are we doing? Before we get started, I just thought I'd point out, I mentioned it to you two guys just before we started, that this is the the day or the, the day before the bank holiday before hopefully Boris Johnson will tell us that we can go out a little bit more, which will be quite helpful. And almost as if to signify that the, the tide was turning is just before we started recording, a couple of swallows landed on the telegraph pole outside my house, which was really rather nice. So summer's here, everybody, uh, which is which is great news. Um, so what we're going to do to start with, um, normally we go into a bit where we talk about what we've been shooting. But if you listen to the last podcast, we actually talked specifically about the fact that what we were going to do between that one and this podcast was actually do a self-portrait. So we all went off and busied ourselves shooting self-portraits. And what we're going to do now, we haven't seen the pictures that each person has done. So what we're going to do now is reveal them to each other. And then almost do a live critique of what we think and we'll talk through what the pictures are. So I'm going to go to you first, Kingsley. Uh, we've all emailed each other our respective pictures. So, Will, are you ready to look at Kingsley's pictures? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, me too. Oh, wow. OK, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Kingsley, do you want to describe this? This is obviously not a visual medium, the uh, podcasting. <laughs> do you want to describe uh, what you've done? Well, yeah, I'll. I'll my, so my approach was... Um, like I said last time, I've done loads of self-portraits, usually for kind of technique things and, you know, the kind of the, the slightly more creative things where you repeat yourself around the frame and kind of do odd stuff and motion blaze yourself and stuff like that. But what kind of struck me was that I've never I've never shot a self-portrait that I, you know, in, in a sort of a regular fashion, like a regular portrait that you take. Um, and part of the reason for that, I think, is because it seems ultimately quite difficult to set up a camera point it at yourself make sure the right parts of you are in focus i.e the eye um and sort of get everything everything spot on but so my idea basically was to was to do that was to do the self-portrait um in a in a sort of a regular style like a what would you call it, like a formal portrait sort of thing yeah, um, it's, it's pretty formal you've got a shirt and tie on which is the first exactly, time i've ever yes, seen I, you with a shirt and tie on <laughs> So I, I made an effort. I thought, I'd, I'd, you know, um, had a shave, comb my hair, um, put a bit of lipstick on. Looks like you're going to time. court. <laughs> <laughs> but what for? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so and the thing and the reason why I thought to do that actually was because I'd been um, testing the new Fujifilm X-T4 and looking at the IAF function. And I thought, well, what a good way to kind of use that feature to. And also it's got that flip out screen. So, you know, typically... Um, if you're trying to do a self-portrait on a camera without a screen like that, you're, you know, you're going to and fro and you're trying to work it out. This obviously helps because you bring the screen around the front, you can see it, it you know, you can set it sort of on a self timer, it'll focus on your eye. And then you're just, you know, you're, you're free to kind of compose yourself within the frame. I mean, it wasn't always successful, but I think I'm sure you'll agree they're they're all amazing. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, I, I, I don't know what you'd what you'd say about him, Will. I, I quite like him. I mean, they, they certainly look like you, Kingsley. I think you're or, or sort of a, a younger you. It looks like you shot it like about. There's definitely been some researching on this. <laughs> it's and a just very flattering, uh, a very flattering light I used. But the funny thing was, well, actually, I, t I had to find like a um, a plain background, obviously, and the best place I could find was in my toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually literally sat on the toilet with a camera pointing at my face. Right. And uh, right. but you'd never know that. And obviously, as I'm sure, as again, I'd say that you'd agree, these are basically GQ cover worthy. Yeah. And we just just so that um, everybody who's listening um, does get the chance to look at these pictures. We are going to put up um, an article on the Photography News website 
as soon as the uh, podcast goes live. So you'll be able to see the pictures that we're actually talking about. But nice shallow depth of field. Eyes very sharp. What do you think, Will? Well, I, I love them. I like the fact he's done four of them. And it could be a good little montage you could put together here, uh, sort of a panel of pictures. And what I like about them also is the fact, you know, I don't think I've ever seen Kingsley clean shaven. I don't think <laughs> I've ever seen him with his shirt and jacket on and a tie. Yeah, is it even me? Incredible. And I'll tell you something, you're a very pretty boy in the, in the way, Kingsley. And I'm sure the uh, the female listeners, well, they'll be flocking to your, wherever they're going to flock to. <laughs> or to his <be> toilet <laughs> door, come, I think, Will. <laughs> you come across very, very nicely. And I think it does show the great use of depth of field, shallow use of depth of field. And it shows how, you know, eye detection AF and face detection AF that can work really well. Something else that um, that struck me while I was doing it, as well as how attractive I obviously am, was that um, when you're trying to do something that's quite, um, there's a sort of a meticulous nature to it, isn't it? And, and like, and when I looked at the pictures back, I thought like, oh, you know, like my collar's not quite right or something like that. And I thought how how um, those kind of shoots are really reliant on sort of stylists and those people who aren't the photographer who are sort of standing next to them, just kind of going like, well, actually you put that bit of hair back into place you know, do this, do that. And yeah, that, that kind of thing that makes it is really sort of helpful. What does it tell you about yourself and how you perceive yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that up to you to judge, I think. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're excellent. Uh, just just tell me a little bit about how they were lit. Is it just, is, is, it, is it toilet window light? <laughs> it is. Well, the, basically the, the best diffuser you can get, which is the misted window of a toilet. Um, and right. I did... Um, I did put in a reflector, I think for some of them, um, just a plain white reflector. I think it's um, it's a, a, a little kind of Lasterlite light one. Just right. one, but I mean, that was another thing actually. So the idea of like trying to frame yourself, um, but and then sort of trying to look natural, but then also holding up a reflector, which kind of changes your body shape slightly and the shape of your jacket or whatever. It's, it's quite complex. So I ended up taking about 400 pictures, I think. Right. And very good they are too. Well done. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think you've done done well. Okay, right. I'm going to move on to Will's uh, because I'm already feeling slightly daunted by the pictures that I've seen so far. So (laughs) I'm going to move on to Will's. So Kingsley, are you ready to to take a look at Will's? Hang on. Whoa. Okay. (laughs) Right. I'm going in. So hang on. So again, we've got. So we've got two again. So we got two. Very very different. Well, guys, I, I had two different ones because I, I wanted um, two styles of pictures, one a dark, moody one and one which is a bit brighter and happier. So I went okay, so, black and white, one colour. Yeah, so what, what we're looking at here is this, there's, there's a black and white pic of Will with a light source above his head and he's looking up at it. And then there's a very, very colourful one, which I'd love to know where he's photographed this. Looks like it's in full sunshine with one of Will's trademark um garish shirts on um and a pair of very uh very bright sunglasses as well so 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 will where was the where was the outdoor shot taken well i'll tell you what happened with the outdoor shot this is literally in my back garden and yesterday you need I, to I was, mow the lawn i was going to mow the lawn <laughs> and i've got a big petrol mower despite the fact my my current garden is the size of a poacher stamp i've got a petrol mower from my previous house and i couldn't start the thing yesterday so the lawn left, was left unmown. So, so you had to lay morning, down. <laughs> when I think about this self, this morning when I got up, I thought self-portrait, self-portrait. I thought there's a patch of daisies outside with a little gap where I thought I could lie. And I styled myself accordingly. And as Kinsey said, there is a lot of styling to be involved. And, you know, when you lie down there, I, I realised, for instance, I did the first few shots, I hadn't buttoned up the shirt properly. So my big belly was hanging out. And then I thought, well, I'll put my hands in the first few again were in the wrong place. Then I tried different glasses. So I did about 50 odd pictures of this. And this was, as you say, in bright, full sunshine. But that's what I wanted. I processed them accordingly. I, I, I used um, Nick software, colour effects, just to change the colour around a bit. But I wanted that unusual composition and the, the background and the daisies. So that was a colourful one. That's tremendous. Really nice pick. Really nice pick. Cool. So what about the black and white, Will? The black and white one, this is my more graphic, moody picture. And I took this using this thing, which apparently is, is like a lightsaber, but I don't, don't really know what a lightsaber is because I'm not a Star Wars fan. But it's this 10-inch torch, effectively, 10-inch lighting source. And I got this because Kenro, the importers of Nanlite, 
uh, I've got a preview sample of this unit. It's called a Pavo Tube 2 6C. Um, there's no price on it yet. It's due in the summer, but it's going to be around £100. But it's an LED light. You can you can change the colour of it and change the colour temperature of all sorts of things. But this came as a review sample, so I thought I'd give it a test. So that's what I did. So I put this above my head on a, on a lighting stand and put myself against the white wall, focus on the tripod, which I, another tripod I had uh, just in front of the, the wall so I could focus on that. And then using the self timer, took a whole bunch of pictures looking different ways in different directions. And again, I processed this quite hard. I used Nick software again. This is Silver Reflex Pro 2. And I went for that very graphic style. So two very different styles, maybe to reflect my my two moods at this point in time. That that reminds me of a kind of uh, an old um, fiber based print from black and white, sort of ag for record rapid days, Will. Absolutely. And that's exactly right. And the, the blurred frame around the edges, it, was, it is very much a hark back to the days of mono. And I had my hand in different places. And I, eventually I like that one where it looks a bit kind of sinister sitting on my on my shoulder like that. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, they, they, I mean, they're so different, aren't they? That's kind of the great thing about it is that is the amount of fun that, and different styles that you can kind of uh, kind of play with. And I, I actually thought of that. I thought about that version of sort of laying on the lawn because it's a great way to get a, a nice background, isn't it? It's like you get a nice flat, even background. And I know it's just covered in daisies, but it's the same sort of principle. Um, yeah, and the kind of I really like the high contrast one. It sort of like she looks like you're. You're kind of pining for freedom in a Mexican jail or something. Like that. <laughs> I am. Do you have Do you have a preference, Will, to 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 which one you prefer? Well, I, I really like the color version in the end because I I, I imagine that since I saw the daisies of this <laughs> uncut lawn, I thought there's a there's self portrait just waiting to be asked done. I took the, I did try different shirts and I've got a whole collection of loud shirts as you know, and this is one I thought that worked really best. Um, so it's going to be a present for Annie, I think, for her. For Christmas and probably next year's birthday present as well. Oh. Still love it. <laughs> the gift of giving. Marvellous. <laughs> OK, well, that just leaves mine, which, um, well, let's see what you make of it. So why don't, why don't you open mine up, guys? Oh, interesting. OK, so, Kingsley, have you got that? I've got a spinning wheel. Hang on. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, look at that. OK, so let me explain a little bit behind it. Um, because there is some thought um, gone into this, which is unique for me. Um, but what I did is actually one of the previous podcasts, I think it was the second one, Will, where you were talking about shooting um, star trails. Bear with me. Um, basically, just so I can explain it very quickly, what, what we've got in front of us is there's a picture. That, well, there's multiple pictures of me. I can tell you there's 15 in total, all wow. montaged into one sort of overall shot and the, the result is not a there's not an obvious likeness of me within it but there's there's lots of pictures of me and the i got i kind of got this idea from multiple places first of all i had a little go at you at doing a star trail following your advice will and i used that star stack software that you talked about which actually worked quite nicely i put a picture up on instagram it got a few likes nobody unfollowed me kingsley which is uh, i'm quite pleased about that Unique, yeah. um but then i sort of got to thinking about i wonder what else you can actually use this star stack software for um and then i was then thinking about after our sort of self-portrait idea i was thinking i wonder how i can create something that will remind me of what we were going through when i created it and so i started off with this idea of taking a selfie using the camera in my computer every day, because the one thing I have been doing is sitting in front of my computer every day. So literally using the, I've got an Apple Mac, using the photo booth app on that, each day I just take a picture of myself doing various different things. You can probably just make out there's one with a set of headphones on, which is when I was editing the last PN podcast. And I've basically done it for every day between the, the PN podcast that we recorded a couple of weeks ago and today. And then what I've done is I've used that StarStack software to put them all together. And it's and then what I've done is put a little grungy border around it in Photoshop and then put an added white border around that as well. But it's I don't know if you um, are familiar with the work of a, uh, uh, or he's actually a sculptor, but he also turns his hand to photography, a chap called Jason Shulman. And what he does is yeah. he takes um, movies and does one long exposure throughout an entire movie. And the results are very impressionistic and incredibly amazing, really. Um, and so I, my idea was to, to try and create something a little bit like that. So that's where that's where mine's come from. So and and if if this portrait were a movie, what which one would it be? 
Um, <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I think. <laughs> there is a sort of a melting. Or Home Alone, quality. maybe. <laughs> Yeah. There is a kind of a, a sort of a melting kind of quality about it, isn't it? I hope everyone kind of gets along to the PN website or, you know, wherever we kind of post these up and has, have a look at the different portraits, because obviously it's difficult, you know, um, for it to come across in the in the medium of radio. <laughs> but it's, I mean, yeah, it's great. Sorry. Um, it took me right back to a photographer by the name of Duane Michaels, who's an American photographer. The Austin did self-portraits and slightly blurry. And you explained the technique. It's very different from what he used to do. He used to shoot film. But immediately when I first saw it, I thought, oh, Dwayne Michaels, self-portrait. Which I think if it reminds me of that, that's, to be fair, credit to you. Nice work. Oh, excellent. Well, it's it's nice to say. I mean, this is definitely worth people trying. Like maybe if you've got a, a group of, of, of photographers who you've been in touch with, maybe it's a camera club thing that you could get all your members to go off and, and do this together. But it's a it's really interesting because this is the first time that we've seen all those different results thrown together. And I think it's pretty safe to say <laughs> that we've all taken a very, very different approach, but ended up with something that which is uh, which is actually quite nice. So nice one, chaps. OK, so moving on, let's let's talk a little bit. We, we thought what we might do is, as I've alluded to uh, at the introduction of this podcast, is looking like as of the weekend or at the end of this weekend, the situation with the lockdown, certainly in England, may well be eased a little bit. And that got us thinking about um, what we might like to do um, if that situation is lifted and where we might like to go or what we might like to photograph given that opportunity. Now, obviously, at the moment, at the time of recording, we don't know what's going to happen. So if it has been that the lockdown has been extended, then please don't take this as, an, as a reason to go out and start um, shooting things all over the place. But um, yeah, so guys, why, why don't we why don't we just we've had a little bit of time to think about this. Um, Kingsley, what was where are you? Where have you hankered to go, or what have you hankered to photograph more while you've been on lockdown? Um, mainly landscapes. I mean, for obvious reasons, because you're stuck in a town. You there's obviously there's some stuff you can do, isn't there? But you can't do a great deal. Um, I'd definitely like to go back if I can this year to the Faroe Islands, which is wonderful place for landscape photographers. Just crazy lands, crazy sort of jutting cliffs and mountains and um it's it's like um it's like a it's a sort of like apocalyptic version of the lofoten islands i think um <laughs> but equal, i mean and, and um having been there um a few years ago i as i have been doing kind of going back to old pictures i found some and reprocessed them and put some of those sort of up on my instagram recently so it, it kind of reminded me what a what a brilliant place it is but the what i will probably do because my folks live in the west country um and the, one of the first trips i'll definitely be making is down to see them um i'm gonna try and um explore dartmoor a bit more and those kind of um those kind of, and maybe exmoor as well those parts of devon get up uh, on the you, tours and do you have any sort of specific locations I, I don't know that part of the world all that well do, are, are there any are there any honey pots for photographers that you're going to go to or avoid um i think a, a lot of them are quite well known there's a wood um there's a is it is it puzzle not puzzle wood that's in um that's near Wales, isn't it? Um, Will, you went to this wood Whist recently, Whistman's didn't you? Wisman's wood. Yeah, which a bit of like a, a bit of an ankle breaker sort of limestoney kind of wood, isn't it? Lots of tangled trees and things. I'd quite like to do that. Um, I might do some wild camping just to make sure that I'm up there at the right time, dawn and, and dusk, and just getting kind of out onto the tops. And what, and what is it? I mean, that's interesting, the, the wild camping thing. So is that is that an approach that you advocate from a photographic perspective that it, it kind of helps you get into the location a little bit more or is it just because you don't want to pay for a hotel <laughs> <laughs> I, I th see my problem with landscape photography is getting up and um it's a lot easier if you're two minutes away from somewhere than if you're an hour and a half away from somewhere and equally you know i don't sleep brilliantly in tents anyway so i'll, I'll probably be up um, and I won't have any excuse to kind of like turn over or just have a cup of tea and ignore the great light. So I, I think it's definitely if you can make the effort, it's definitely better to be to be out there. You might be sort of less refreshed, but you won't have the commute. Uh, so what about you, Rog? What are you planning to do when you get out and about? Well, actually, um, I know the obvious thing to do is go to a, a new location, and shoot somewhere that you've not sh photographed before or revisit a location. But I'm actually I've realized that one of the things during this lockdown that I haven't I've missed more than anything is my family. 
Um, and obviously I've seen them, um, you know, on, on video calls. Um, but I think the thing that's most, uh, that's really stood up the most for me is that I had a, I had a, new, a granddaughter, our first granddaughter arrived in December and um, we saw her a couple of times before the lockdown happened. And then basically I've seen her sort of gradually grow up on WhatsApp. Mm. Um, and it's made me realize that I think that uh, what I really need to do is, uh, is photograph my family more. So obviously I'm hoping that one of the things that we will be able to do if the if the lockdown is easy, we'll be able to go out and see our family groups a bit more. And I think what I'm going to do, I mean, I'll, I'll ease into it a little bit, but I, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to start taking a few more pictures of them. Do you think you'll I mean, do you think you'll do it in a certain style or just, a, you know, just more like a documentary kind of way? I think it'll, yeah, maybe a documentary kind of way. But I think the thing is about family pictures is that it kind of doesn't really matter. Well, well, to me anyway, it, I don't think it really matters what they look like. It's more about um, what, it, what it reminds you of, um, like a certain time and a certain, you know, a certain time in somebody's life or a certain event that you went to or, or something like that. So I think I think that there have definitely been times uh, more recently where I've I've not taken a camera because it's like, oh, no, I won't bother taking a camera. And actually, I think what I will do now is I'll definitely take a camera more along to sort of family events. I mean, I suppose the other thing that I am going to be really looking forward to doing as well is um, I'm fortunate enough because of uh, the job that I do to be able to get um, to go to New York quite regularly. And it's actually one of my favorite places in the in the world. Um, and again, you know, it's more like uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I guess when I've, the last few times I've been going to New York, I've not really taken very many pictures. And of course, you know, I've now I've seen during the lockdown time, I've seen some absolutely amazing work from people who've been going out while it's all locked down um, and just seeing some of the scenes that I'm so used to being, you know, seeing with absolutely packed with people like Times Square and uh, Central Park and all that sort of thing. And so definitely I think that, you know, the next time I get back to going there, which probably won't be until next year now, I think I'll uh, I'll definitely make more of an effort to get out and about with a camera and, and really start to capture the essence of the place because I I kind of feel like I know it quite well now. Well, one location I don't want to get back to, but I'm not sure how possible it will be and, and how I feel about it, but of course it's Venice because I was due to go there last April anyway. Mm. So that trip was cancelled, obviously. So I'm not sure about that. And I've got a trip also towards the end of the year to America and I'm umming and ahhing about that at the moment. So Annie and I, my partner, we we're talking about it and we think, well, America, maybe maybe it'll be difficult, so we don't know. So the focus, I think, for us, certainly for me, is very much going to be UK-based. Mm -hmm. So, and believe it or not, I actually want to go to London because um, I do a lot of photography there anyway. But I think mm -hmm. when, and oh, I haven't had a chance to go down during lockdown, of course, it'd be nice, it would have been nice to get some pictures of empty streets. But I think going down there when people are allowed back out, it'll be quite interesting, actually, see how people are reacting to being out again. Yeah, and maybe going for a, a meal and sitting around a cafe. Obviously, we don't know what, how much is going to be open when, when I do go, if I can get there. Have you got any favourite spots in London that you'd like well, to visit? I still have a project on the docks of Light Railway, so that's that's one. But I'll just hang around the West End because I think, you know, obviously, again, we don't know how tourists, you know, how they're going to see London. Are they going to come flooding back? Because that's the interesting thing as well. It's not just locals and British people, but also foreigners coming in and enjoying the city. What is your uh, photographic approach to London? Are you, are you, do you become a street photographer there or do you, are you kind of looking for gritty black and white stuff, a bit like your self portrait that you showed us earlier? Well, I'm one of those people who kind of do, does everything depending on the light and my mood. And I shoot everything anyway. So even though I might not be in a, as you say, a black and white gritty mood, I'll often think about oh, later on if I work on this, this could be that or that or the other. But I do a lot of street, a lot of doing urban architecture. I do a lot of night in London as well. Uh -huh. So I could sample all three in, in one trip, you know, go there early in the morning, stay there till late at night uh, and do a mini, as it's relevant to photography news, you know, mini photo 24, where I stay late and just go do some stuff. So London's certainly a place I want to do. But, and the other place I want to do is more Scotland. You know, I don't know the West Coast very well from, I'm not, I'm not saying Glasgow and Edinburgh, but further north on the west side in particular, up the sky, and maybe even the water over the Cape Wrath. Now, I'm not a great walker, and neither is Annie, but I'm sure there are plenty of places we can stop and take pictures. And I'm certainly not going to do what Kingsley is thinking about doing and wild camping in early in the morning. I, I need the B&B &B and the com and creature comforts and getting up at a you know, leisurely time. But, you know, you never know. I, I might do old goal early in the morning. I mean, those sort of places are certainly worth doing. But for me, it's going to be Scotland. 
London and actually all around the coast as well. There's so much stuff in this country which we oversee because travel abroad is so easy. But I think now I think I won't be alone in this, but I think there's a focus back on what we have and what's easily available and we don't have to travel anywhere to get there. When you're you're saying about kind of basically getting getting into London and doing a sort of a full day's photography, do you ever feel like you you spend too long shooting? I mean, you know you know how you know that thing where you kind of you go out and some people say, well, you know, the best two shots are the first one and the last one. You, you ever have that thing where you kind of no, you, you get a bit mad for it? No, the thing is, I, mean, I think you have to. Well, to be fair, you have to pace yourself. And let's face it, when I go to London, yeah, I, I, initially it's very exciting. Again, depending on the light, you go do lots of pictures, but I'm all for wine o'clock. So as soon as it's appropriate, and of course, we don't know if the pubs will be open now. But if the pubs open, I think I'll have a glass of red or a pint or something. Have a break and have a relax. And basically, obviously, the creativity is loosened as well by the imbibing, by imbibing of some alcohol. The, the thing I was going to ask, Will, is... Um... Because I think it's, I think you're right that people are going to look at a, a, a lot closer to home in terms of what to photograph. But obviously, the challenge for a lot of people is how they photograph something that they see very regularly. And obviously, you're a regular visitor to London. Uh, we've all got immediate vicinities that we see very regularly. And and I mean, how do you? What advice would you say for trying to get people to look at things in a different way? Do you, do you have any sort of ways of working in that respect? Well, I, I think the fact is, though, Rog, the, the word look is the key thing here, because it's so easy to take things for granted. So, in effect, you're actually not looking. So I think if you walk around and look up what's above you and what's at your feet, try different lenses and, and force yourself into some shooting scenarios. And the key thing, though, and the word you use is look, and that is so spot on. Just look. It's really easy. It's photography, like, look at what you're doing. In terms of um, tackling things differently, I, I mean, I've also recently shot a lot more telephoto landscapes and something that's something I'd like to get back into doing more and Will mentioning London and other cities it reminds me that that that's a great place to use a telephoto lens as well I mean for you know not you, you wouldn't advocate using them for street photography because that's a bit like being a sniper or something but um, more to do with actually picking out little bits of architecture or little sort of glimpses of buildings through other buildings and stuff like that that's that's a different way of seeing is that is that the propensity to shoot telephoto landscapes not just uh, because you're lazy and can't get out of the car? <laughs> <laughs> I will out of the tent, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've got some more listener questions that uh, have been sent in. Thank you very much for sending those in. Um, as always, the way to get in touch with us is podcast at photographynews.co.uk. Uh, that's podcast at photographynews.co.uk. Uh, you can also obviously uh, see us on the website, photographynews.co.uk. And if you want to sign up to the digital edition of the magazine, the best way to do that is go to the is go to getpn.co.uk. Um, if you do that between now and the end of this month, you'll be in with the chance of um, winning a, an Olympus TG6 tough camera. So uh, by all means, do that as well. So thanks for the people who've got in touch with us. We've got three to go through here. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get some uh, some gems of information out of uh, out of Will, particularly on this. So let's let's dive straight in. Get a, get a question here from Bob uh, in Ipswich. Bob Anders in Ipswich. He has said during lockdown, I've been thinking of entering some photographic competitions. Any tips to help me stand a better chance? Now, Bob, you have come to the right place because we we <laughs> so happen to have a resident photographic judge for the rps is that right will i do sit on the distinctions panel for uh, travel photography for the rps right and i okay. do do judging quite often and quite regularly and i've judged some quite large competitions and okay bob, so let's get a kingsley then <laughs> <laughs> i mean bob, so that's on, will. a very good question it is it's a huge wide-ranging question and i'm not sure i can answer it in the few minutes we have but basically Bob, firstly, they're worth, definitely worth entering because somebody's got to win. And there are some amazing prizes up there. Although I know some contests cost a few quid, but I think the effort's well worthwhile. But the thing is for me is, as a judge, and often you, when, when you get to a judging session, you get any number of pictures in front of you. It could be hundreds, it could be thousands. And so you don't have a great deal of time as a judge. You don't sit there and ponder every picture in, in a huge 
chin scratchy sort of way. So for me, apart from obviously things like interpreting the theme, getting things sharp, the right colour, that sort of thing, go for impact, something that makes people stop in their tracks. And it may well be, Rog, it could be like your self-portrait because you go, actually, you do stop at that. And you have a look at it. And OK, you may go, actually, it doesn't sound like you're getting no chance of winning. But hey, it's actually made me stop and look at it. And I think that's the first thing. Make the judge stop and look at and think about what's in front of him or her. Um, and that's a good thing to start with. And if, if, that's, if I had to give one single piece of advice, I would say, Bob, go for impact. And, and what would you say is the is the main mistake that people make? Well, I mean, there, there are lots of lots of technical mistakes. Obviously, that they, they don't re- people don't read the rules. I mean, a simple mistake, <laughs> which is uh, they just miss the closing date. But they don't read the rules. They don't think about the interpretation of the competition. I mean, the the organisers give a theme for a reason, and the idea is you interpret that theme in a, as creative a way as you can manage. But don't go off piste. Don't go, well, actually, the judge actually wants to see this type of photograph when they actually don't. So just just read the rules. It, it's fairly simple. That's the biggest mistake. And, you know, if they say they want a resolution of a picture to be 1,500 pixels across, make it 1,500 pixels across. Don't, it's not 15,000 and it's not 15. It's 1,500. But just follow some real simple guidelines. It's not that difficult. But to get into the final judging of any competition, I think what you need to do is have Im- images that just have an impact, that say something to the judges in that short period of time, because you may only have three or four seconds to consider an image. And if your picture doesn't have that impact and an immediate message, you might as well not bother. What about you, Kingsley? Have you have you judged competitions in your time? I'm sure. Yeah, you have. for um, yeah, for, for um, photo mags, but not 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 to the not to the august level that that William has. Well, nobody has. Um, no. I, I think I mean on on a broader view I I just think um I just think they're well it's just well worth doing it's well worth challenging yourself um and particularly not you know if you're looking at a competition that just says you know oh it's a portrait competition but well, fine you enter a portrait but I I've always found it more interesting um kind of going for competitions that have these slightly more esoteric kind of uh, themes so they're a bit more open to interpretation and they're a bit more sort of challenging um creatively but like the other thing i'd say is just like you know is don't um don't take it too seriously if you're if you're not successful because part of it is just as i say challenging yourself and kind of trying to come up with something that you like and and just on that i mean the the what about will when when winners are announced so if people get the rejection slip back and they don't they haven't been successful do you think that it's it's worthwhile um, looking at the winning images and trying to work out why they won, or do you think that just ends up pe- sort of get, getting people tied up in knots? Well, it can work both ways. Um, and, and Kingsley's point is, is very well made in that not everybody can win. You know, it's, it's like any sport, there's, there's only be one winner or a handful of winners. So don't take it personally. I mean, it's um, it can be a lottery, some of these competitions, because of the pure numbers. But certainly if you're thinking of entering the following year and you didn't get any success this year, yeah, by all means, look at the winners, but then don't necessarily copy them. Just because they won this year doesn't mean they're going to win. That style of image is going to win next year. Just to look at what's being offered and, and see if you can give your own spin on it. So don't get too too upset if you don't win. But obviously, it costs a few quid, so you want to get value for it. Some competitions are very good. They give feedback on every entry. And, um, you know, that, that can make it worthwhile, too, because you get some feedback from the judges. But it's difficult. Competitions aren't an easy thing to win. It's, you know, it's so different from into the national lottery you know the odds are millions to one there but here they could be hundreds or thousands to one but the fact is if you do get success it can do you so much good just just to, i mean offer a slightly contrary opinion to that will i, I remember that um i was always quite surprised because in my time when i was on photo mags i used to do a fair amount of judging with you with you as well will um and and a lot of the time it actually just to get things like hit the brief get it sharp and things like that immediately put you in the top 10 percent of entries you know it was like there was there's some really so although i think a lot of people don't enter because um they think that there's going to be thousands and thousands of entries but in reality even if a competition has thousands of entries it may actually come down to a sort of top four or five percent of those entries that are actually um that are actually sort of decent you, you're right in, t- in terms of interpretation of the theme and, and all that 
Um, but go for it. That's the that's the thing. And the point you make also about the technical quality. Certainly, when the days of film, where people, for instance, people could not print their black and white very well often. Mm. So immediately, a lot of a lot of images were rejected for technical reasons. Nowadays, that's less of, less of an issue because you know most cameras deliver sharp pictures. Most people shoot raw files and can and can manipulate quite well. So the technical level is is something which is even out a bit. And that actually, the, the the consistent level result uh, of technical quality is achieved by by many entrants. And that's what you have to have impact. You have to have something different that makes it people stop and look at your picture. Shows how long it's been since I've judged the competition. <laughs> um, so, right, there we go. Well, hopefully, Bob, that's answered your question. Some good stuff there. Let, let's move straight on to the next one, um, which is from D. It, well, I think it's from D in Paris, as opposed as opposed to D Paris. Um, and he or she has asked, I've been enjoying your discussions about favourite and best ever cameras from previous podcasts. But what models do you use now? Have any of you switched completely to mirrorless? Right, I'm going to go first here because my answer is really simple. I've got one camera and it's the uh, Fujifilm X100S. That is the only camera that I can actually call my own. Um, and that's largely due to the fact that um, well, I've sold all my other kit, but I haven't actually, I haven't actually, don't feel I actually need any more cameras other than that. Um, I'm in a fortunate position, obviously working on PN, that I do get to um, try my hand with other cameras, and and I tend to gravitate because of that towards uh, the Fujifilm brand. So things like X Pro Three and stuff like that, I've been using reasonably regularly. But yeah, I, I don't actually have too many cameras at all. But I know you chaps are still hoarding all sorts of gear. What about you, Kingsley? Um, I, so I probably mentioned on previous things, I've got a D850 Nikon, um, which is a brilliant camera and I love it, but I am swayed and I am tempted by a mirrorless camera. And that is kind of down to the stuff that I was talking about in the, in the self portrait thing where, you know, things like, um, I autofocus faster frame rates, technically faster autofocus, like using the, um, the Sony a nine, you know, you, the, just the level of the level of performance from that is quite incredible. The trouble I've found personally is that although most mirrorless cameras from different manufacturers do something really well, I haven't really found one yet that does everything brilliantly. And that's what I'm kind of waiting for. And I'm sort of hoping that it's going to be a Nikon so I can stick all the lenses on. <laughs> so what? Well, so when you say it does everything brilliantly, what is what are the top three things on your shopping list that it has to do really well? Um, the first one is... Um, being used to a really good optical viewfinder, I want a brilliant EVF um, right. because as good as they now are, um, and I think personally, I think the best one I've used is the Nikon Z1. Um, there's still something slightly missing for me, um, but, you know, you, you get used to it. Um, and I think definitely the eye autofocus, I'd like, I know the Sony and some of the others have now got a sort of animal eye AF function. I, I definitely like that because it helped with my dog photography. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is certainly the um, the blackout. Um, so the only mirrorless camera I think so far that I know of that does a completely blackout free um, EVF view is that um, Sony A9, which means you get that sort of uninterrupted view of the subject, just like you get in a in an optical viewfinder i mean i know an optical viewfinder you will get like the mirror kind of going up and down but somehow quite a lot of less cameras sort of seem to lag and there's just something slightly disconnected from it and that's kind of goes back to the problem i have with evfs is that there's a lack of connection so even though you see what you get and that's really kind of useful um it's still there's still a sort of a they're still inferior to an optical viewfinder in in connection i think so yeah those would be the three things i'd I'd be looking for. So, Will, what about you guys? <laughs> well, look, guys, I've got a whole bunch of cameras, and as you know, I test them anyway when they come into the photography news office. But a couple of film cameras I still use. I've got this um, pinhole camera from La Rouge, which is a beautiful wooden thing. I've got two of those. I've got a Bel Air, which is a, a Lomography camera. So I've got film cameras there. I've got a Leica, uh, which I'm starting to use now because that came out as a cover the other day from the previous podcast. And once I clicked the shutter, I thought I might must use this. So my film cameras are still getting an outing, or they will just certainly want to get out and about. Digitally, I've got any number of cameras which I use regularly, but I've got a Nikon D850, which I love. I've got several Fujifilm X cameras. The XC3 I really like. Um, so I'm waiting for the uh, the update of that because I like using that for street work. 
And my favourite camera at the moment is my medium format Fujifilm GFX 50R, which I've been doing a lot of pictures with. Um, and I love the files you get from that. You know, I know the files are 1.7 times bigger than 35 millimeter, but the um, the quality you can squeeze out of those files is just lovely. Um, so I'm really keen on just getting more and more use out of that. But that's my favourite camera right now. So you're so you're part mirrorless. I'm part mirror, mirrorless. Um, that I'm like mirrorless place. curious. <laughs> well, the 850 has been used an awful lot during lockdown, I have to say, because I've got a macro lens with it, which takes me down to one to one. So some of the stuff I've been doing, you know, like we talked about it before, you know, water dyes in water and oil and uh, water drops. I've been using a macro lens a lot. Um, so my full frame is still getting um, a good, good deal of use. So, I mean, can, sort of bouncing it back to you, um, Rog, you obviously you're saying you, you only have that X100F, was it? S. Uh, the X100S, but yes. I mean, and, and using the Fujifilm X series cameras, that, that kind of does mean that you are exclusively mirrorless. I mean, what, what do you, would anything bring you back to an SLR? No, I, I genuinely don't think so. Um, and I think that's largely because I use, um, when I do, when I do shoot, um, I tend to shoot video as well as, uh, as well as stills. Uh, and I know you guys perhaps don't maybe do quite as much i mean I'm not, I'm not saying i'm a prolific video shooter but i just find shooting video on um on mirrorless cameras is, is just so much easier and, and simpler than it is on a dslr so um no so in all honesty i mean i think the only the only kind of thing that i think really hampers mirrorless i mean it is is the battery stuff um and the fact that batteries I, the, the one thing that slrs have always had DSLRs have always had over mirrorless is, is the is the battery longevity and you know and you can get thousands of frames out of a out of a, a, a DSLR battery less so with mirrorless so if they ever manage to crack that um I'll be uh, I'll never look at a DSLR again just on battery though I mean um, I, I think nowadays we're used to I mean when I take my Fujifilm X series out I always take a good number of batteries with me so I know there's an issue mm. but I think there's also now the benefit of uh, some of these cameras coming out with USB charging and so I've always got a power bank. I think most of us have when we go out because we've got it for our phones. And now you just plug the camera into the power bank for a few minutes while you're having a, a pint or your lunch or whatever on the train <laughs> and just top up the, the battery. It's, it's wonderful innovation. And I think every There's a theme here, isn't it? it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so, <laughs> Part of wine in Will's case. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably because during lockdown, I've actually not drunk much at all. Oh, right. Well, look out, Will. <laughs> Will's going to be on it. Yay! <laughs> Okay, great. Good question. Thank you very much, Dee. Hope that answers your question. And then the last one, this is probably really short and sweet, gents, but uh, uh, a lady called Rebecca, Rebecca Tate has got in touch and she's asked us quite simply, what's the best piece of photographic advice we've ever been given? So Kingsley, take the lens cap off. <laughs> yeah, but I never, I can never remember it. Um, no, my best advice, I think, and the one, well, certainly what stuck with me the most was I interviewed a guy called Gregory Heisler years ago, who's a famous American portrait photographer, who um, I think this may not be the case anymore, but certainly at that time he had some sort of record for the most numbers of covers of Time magazine that he'd shot. Um, and anyway, he said that his advice, or it might have been actually something that someone said to him as well, but they, the, the idea was simply shoot what you can't help but shoot and the idea of that is that shoot the stuff you love you'll carry on shooting at you carry on shooting it you'll get better and better and better at it and it it never gets old you know you're, you're constantly interested in what you're shooting so you know you want to explore it you want to embrace it and that's kind of what got me into um, dog photography i love dogs and um and so you know it seemed natural to kind of to um, make something of a, a profession out of it, even though I very rarely get paid for actually taking pictures of dogs. <laughs> Will, what was your greatest piece of advice? Compared with Kingsley's piece of advice, this is nothing as, as erudite and as well thought through as, as yours, Kingsley, but my simple bit of advice I had when I was much younger, when I only had a camera and a lens, a 50 millimeter lens, so this is where I started out. So I had one film camera and one 50 millimeter lens because that's all I could afford. And I remember when I first joined the camera club and I was, Moan, bemoaning the fact they only had one focal length lens one of the guys in the camera club I can't remember his name but he just said to me use your feet it's a very simple bit of advice it's really obvious but that's one that's stood me in good stead so when I'm ever I'm framing up a shot even now I don't think about the zooming thing I think about have I got the right perspective I might take a step to the left to the right backwards or forwards whatever it might be and I think that's a piece of advice which a, many, a good many photographers could take on board 
and improve their work with. So move your feet. Move your feet. Um, well, well, my bit of advice, um, and having worked for, with Will for a long time, one bit of advice that he gave me was take up fishing rather than photography. Which, uh, <laughs> I never actually, thankfully, or well, maybe not thankfully, I didn't follow up on that. But the one bit of advice that I did listen to was from a photographer called Les McLean, who, um, and it kind of goes back a little bit, actually, weirdly, Kingsley, because he was a photographer who used to go and um stay where he was taking his landscape pictures he was a he was a, a great landscape photographer and he often used to literally go and wild camp in places he used to go out to the glencoe and stuff like that in the depths of winter and it helped him sort of um get get the feeling of the location i digress mm. slightly because his advice that he that he passed on to me and, and i'm happy to pass on to other people is photograph the light um, and it's a very simple thing, but it, but actually it, it makes you look at every single thing that you photograph in a different way because you can walk over to something and photograph it. But then if you look at it again and see how it's lit, you will almost invariably take a different photograph of it because you'll move yourself around. You'll explore a little bit more about a subject. So rather than photographing the subject, photograph the light that is falling on it. Okay, um, so I think we've been around for far too long, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up now. Um, just very quickly for us to mention the uh, photography news website, photographynews.co.uk. Um, obviously, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can get us on at Photo News PN. And we've also just launched again our monthly PN Pick Me competition, which if you use social media. Um, if you send us an image on any of those uh, platforms, just use the hashtag PNPICME, P-N-P-I-C-M-E. Um, just share any pictures that you've taken and we basically pick a, pick a winner each month and uh, give them some veneration on the uh, Photography News website. Gentlemen, I think we're just about done. But of course, we never finished a podcast without a Will's word of wisdom. So Will, regale us with some wisdom. Well, my, my advice this podcast is quite a simple one. Um, take more pictures and set yourself a project or two. And don't get too hung up with the word project. I don't mean word project. It used to be a series of pictures. It could be a project in an area you're in. It could be a, a, an hour project. It can be a, a year long project. It can be a subject led project. So at any one time, I must have a dozen, a pro dozen projects going. So, for instance, I'm shooting Piers. That's something I've written about in the magazine before. I'm shooting the, the London Docklands Light Railway. I've been doing that for several years. But some of my projects involve, well, photographing toilets, for instance. You know, sometimes, and don't get me wrong, guys, I don't go around stalking people and following people. Into, Were you there when, when Kingsley did his self-portrait? <laughs> <laughs> I saw something lurking in the corner. <laughs> he didn't spot me. But no, the, the things about it, there's so many things to photograph. And I do photograph toilets. Sometimes when you go into a urinal, and for instance, I went to a pub in Greenwich, and the urinal looked like, um, you know, the, the hot lip symbol with Mick Jagger's Rolling Stones. And the, the urinal is with that shape. I thought, well, I'm going to take a picture of it. You, you can't fail not to. So my advice to, to readers is, if you want to improve their photography, give yourself something to shoot. Give yourself some projects. It might just be... You know, knockers on a, on a door. It might be manhole covers. It might be rubbish on the street. I do all those sort of things. Just get using your camera. And once you start using your camera, you see more pictures. I think uh, knock, knockers and toilets, it's going to be locked up, not locked down for Wilbury. So. <laughs> you very carry on, Kingsley. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. I am the Charles Haltry of photography. <laughs> <laughs> OK, brilliant. Thanks for that, Will. Well, uh, I think that just leaves me to um, say cheers to Kingsley. Thank you, Kingsley. Thanks very much. Um, you hopefully back in a see couple you, of weeks. Yeah, hopefully see you in the real world fairly soon. Yeah, absolutely. And to you too, Will. Stay safe, mate. And uh, Take hopefully care, not too long before I see you again. So thanks very much for listening. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks. And of course, stay safe and uh, hopefully enjoy your photography. OK, cheers. <laughs>
Oh, yeah. right, nice. Yeah, in the it's yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> That was a terrible impression of a lightsaber. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's rather short, I know. I know you're a Star Trek man, but... <laughs>